We continue now with um, Mr. Gorka Espiao speaking about disruptive urban social innovation. Let's welcome him. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, I'm here uh, today to present um, the work that the Young Foundation is doing in disruptive urban social innovation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the work of the Young Foundation, it is a <clears throat> well-established foundation in, in the UK, uh, following the legacy of uh, Michael Young, who was one of the architects of the welfare state in the UK and one of the uh, pioneers of social entrepreneurship and, and, and social economy. Among other things, he created uh, the Open University, the first school for social entrepreneurs, and many other uh, institutions and organizations. Uh, the Young Foundation has always been a key uh, uh, institution in conceptualizing what social innovation means, how, um, how do we scale social innovation, and uh, how can we uh, transform this, uh, this field. So I uh, can see there is a problem in the format of the slides. Always the Mac gives us these problems. But um, I'll try to explain you what, uh, well, uh, what I want to do is just to share with you some thoughts about the, the work connecting social innovation and city and regional transformation. And, uh, and then to present uh, uh, examples of the, of the, of the work we are, we are doing. Um, the the um, kind of the, the underlying principle uh, that we are operating is that the smart city uh, concept is not going to solve the social problems that we are that we need to tackle in the cities. There is a growing consensus that uh, the smart city approach, although is definitely needed, and uh, we have seen very good examples of how technology contributes to make better cities and better societies. Uh, although we need that, and we need to collaborate uh, much more with uh, private actors, as uh, those companies that we have seen uh, before, uh, the reality is that technology actually increases the gap of inequality. And there are, uh, you can read uh, very recent uh, excellent articles at MIT Technology Review or at Foreign Affairs magazine in the, just in the last few months uh, demonstrating that technology uh, actually uh, generates a new difference, a new class difference as well, about those who have the capacity to access the technology, those who are, have the capacity, the, the knowledge and the resources to develop technology, and those who can't. And actually, the, the example of, that the, my previous speaker was presenting about who lives near the airports, I think is a very good example of, of, of this new social divide. So we see cities, that the cities are getting smarter, we are getting, uh, in t from technology point of view, better, but then we see that the social divide and inequality is growing. So, so we have this paradox where in, the, in today's cities, and I think London is a very good example of this, you have in the same area, sometimes even in the same neighborhood, one street where it is very, very wealthy, where uh, uh, technology works really well, and in the same, uh, uh, around the corner, you will have another street that uh, the level of income is, is it's, it's really, really, really low. And this, so these communities are living and sharing the same space. And if we don't act, this uh, uh, growing inequality is going to be bigger and bigger. So, um, so, so that's, that's the field where social innovation comes in, into the, the discussion about making cities and regions smarter and how can we transform the way that we approach uh, these concepts. Uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, approach, how social innovation is understood. Uh, for those of you that are uh, not that familiar, uh, initially social innovation was a reaction of the social 
uh, field to technology innovation, saying that only technological innovation is, is not enough. You need to introduce innovation in uh, the social sphere as well. So it's innovation about services, it's innovation about procedures, it's innovation about uh, social good. That is the purpose of this conference. So that was the, at the beginning in the last you know, 15 years, the discussion about what social innovation means, how we conceptualize that, and how can we, we connect technology, innovation, and social, and social innovation. Some of you are probably familiar with this spiral of innovation that the Young Foundation created many years ago that tried to explain the process of social innovation. How do we start from ideas, uh, prototypes into a scale? How do we you know, follow the traditional process of, uh, of innovation? The good news is that uh, we have been able to um, uh, convince uh, the most important international institutions that social innovation is as equally important as technology innovation. Uh, in Europe, uh, there's, there's an image here of a report uh, presented by the European Commission about uh, how social innovation should be embedded in, all, poli in all, of all policies in the Union. At the moment, social innovation is everywhere within the European, within the European Commission. So this, that, that is the good news, that we have been able to uh, introduce the discussion into the mainstream uh, um, um, policy uh, debate. The problem, the risk is that um, it's still not very clear the outcome of the outcome of such innovation because we are, normally we talk about services and services are very difficult to touch. So there are only a few products that we can present as very good examples of social innovation. For example, I don't know if you're familiar with this company, uh, Furphone, that is the only one company who can actually manufacture mobile telephones demonstrating that all components of this telephone have been uh, produced uh, following human rights standards. No other company in the world can say that. So if you talk about how the batteries are done, how the, you know, all the components that are, that are in this, in this uh, uh, terminal, the rest of the companies are actually uh, involved in very, very <laughs> difficult operations all around the world. Uh, to get the minerals and to get um, access to for making telephones, but there are, there are products, there are companies that are in the market fighting that that, that battle very very successfully. But that that's kind of a rare example. Uh, normally we're talking about about services, and it is difficult to uh, mm, not to be identify social innovation, not to be identified as an, as another buzzword. And sometimes we mix a lot of concepts. We need, we kind of identify social innovation with social economy, or we identify social innovation with social entrepreneurship. And there are things, of course, related, but they're not the same thing. And if we don't uh, differentiate, I think we have the risk that the outside world will never take us seriously. So social economy is something that has been very well established for a long time, but social innovation is about the innovation factor. And this is something that uh, we have been told about this morning, I think, very, very accurately. If there is no innovation, there is no social innovation. So, so what is the new ways of doing things that we are, that we are um, uh, proposing? But also, uh, social entrepreneurship is one dimension of social innovation. We can do uh, small-scale social entrepreneurship or we can do systemic change in another level. So there are different uh, areas of, of intervention. At the Young Foundation, we are particularly interested in disruptive innovation. And these are also concepts that normally we, we also mix, incremental and disruptive innovation. When we talk about incremental innovation, we talk about things that can make what is existing better. When we talk about disruptive, it's about how we introduce new ideas, new products, new services that are going to change the system, that are going to change the way that things operate. And we are convinced that the, in the field of social innovation, we need much more disruptiveness than incremental. Because incremental, uh, what we see at the moment is um, that the problems we, need, we are trying to tackle, and some of the problems we have been describing this morning, it is about 
uh, energy, it is about unemployment, it's about health, it's about, you know, the, all these problems are complex systems. They are not just, you know, isolated themes that we can tackle uh, separately. So, if we try to introduce incremental solutions, we normally th get things a little bit better, but it's very difficult to have an impact on the system. So, in our opinion, it is very, very important to change our, our, the way that we see uh, the problems we are facing and to understand the problems as complex systems and also understand the cities and the regions as complex systems. Because if we don't have this complex system approach, then we try to solve one particular problem and the impact of our intervention is very limited. And this is one of the main challenges we are having at the moment. There are millions of really interesting initiatives. When we evaluate the impact of what we are doing, at the moment it's quite limited. In our opinion, it has to do with this lack of complex system approach. So, um, so this is what we are, we are trying to do. We are trying to understand uh, problems differently. We are trying to tackle these problems for a more disruptive approach, and we are trying to use new tools. What are the new tools that we have in our hands to design more connected, larger scale social interventions? Um, in, uh, um, this is probably the most important idea that I want to share with you, is that if we are trying to solve, or we're trying to tackle these uh, huge societal challenges, uh, we cannot solve these problems by ourselves. There is no one organization, there is no one individual that is going to have the solution to all these problems. We need to create movements of transformation. And, and who takes part in these movements of transformation? At least three main pillars. We need civil society actors, we need civil society organizations, people better connected in the way that uh, ORU is trying to do. We need the private sector totally involved that is normally dissociated from these conversations. I'm very glad to uh, hear this morning's presentations that is some very good exceptions. And we need the public sector. We need an alliance with the governments, with the cities, with the institutional framework. Only if we connect these three, these three levels, those movements will, will, will be, be possible to be, uh, to be formed. And those movements need to have also a, a bigger aspirational goal. If, we, if it's only about how we fix a particular problem, people will say, well, that's interesting. If we say, let's try to change the city, this, let's tr ch try to change this region. Let's try to change the way that world, the world operates about telephone, uh, mobile telephones. That is different. There is an aspirational goal that brings people to act in a much more uh, um, active way. So, uh, in terms of cities, uh, we believe, and this is what we are doing, that city transformation movements can only be co-created generating a new narrative of transformation. New narratives of transformation. How do you build these movements? You build the movements by generating new narratives of transformation. If you go to any city, Geneva, London, or Bilbao, where I come from, there is always a narrative, a collective narrative about that place. There can be different ones, but there is normally a coming of a, 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 um, a general uh, narrative. That narrative can be positive or negative, but that narrative changes during the time. It is not a static. So if we can generate new narratives of change, we have the power to make a lot of changes in the city and in the region. So we need projects, we need to identify very concrete and tangible projects, but we also need new narratives of, um, of, uh, of, um, of transformation. And those narratives normally also generate a new identities new identities that, are can, that have the real power to tackle such, a, uh, such big challenges. We normally think that uh, we are associated with one or two identities, but in fact we are associated with many, many identities. So how to connect identities with narratives and movement buildings, in our opinion, is the, 
it is the key. Just to give you an example of this, as I said, I come from Bilbao uh, in the Basque country, and I work with the Aguirre Center there as well, but it's trying to understand uh, the transformation of the Basque country. Normally, there is a superficial uh, understanding of the transformation. Uh, we have an architect speaking later, and he can tell you a lot about the, the architectonic transformation of Bilbao. Bilbao was a terrible place uh, where we had uh, unemployment uh, about 30% only 30 years ago, more than 50% of unemployment for young people. We had uh, the collapse of all industry uh, in ecologic terms. You know, the river was between brown and black, depends on the day. And we also had uh, terrorism and violence. So normally, though in, a, in a place where you have all those negative factors, it is very, very difficult to see transformation happen. If you go to Bilbao today, what you see is the Guggenheim building uh, as an example of this transformation. And normally people will talk about transformation saying, you know, uh, this is a very simplistic way, but this is the, the way it works. Bilbao was a very terrible place. Then Frank Gehry came and he built the Guggenheim. And look at Bilbao now. And many cities have tried to replicate this. Okay, let's make a building and the city will transform. And they miss totally the whole point. But the whole point is that the building is an expression of a transformation that's, that was already taking place. There was a transformation that was coming from a new narrative generated in the city, in the region saying, we are not gonna be stuck here. We are gonna change this and we are gonna work together. So that was a time where there was a real public-private partnership with a bit deep social economy uh, um, connection. This is, is not a coincidence that we have the Mondragon Corporation that is the largest industrial cooperative group in the world. And those, those reconstructions in the social network and the social economy sphere generated the revenues that made possible the Guggenheim. And that collaboration made possible to think that what Bilbao needed was a building like the Guggenheim. So this is the kind of thinking that uh, we feel that is needed in terms of transforming our cities and regions. So my suggestions, for a practical suggestion is try to design based on ethnography and co-production, larger scale uh, social innovations that are interconnected that are also uh, bringing together public and private institutions, uh, plus uh, the, the third sector, and do a deeper analysis on what is the narrative of that place? What are the values associated? What are the values that we want to be associated with place in the future? And how can we transition from point A to point B? There is, the more, there is, a, there is a, a work about movement building, about using the social uh, uh, networks and the capacity that we have today to build uh, collaborations uh, digitally, but it's also about very concrete and tangible projects that will present that this is much more than just a public discussion. So if we do that, I think we can generate those movements of transformation. Just to, give, to finalize, I'll give you um, an example of the methodology that we are using in, in two cities in the UK. Uh, we are working with the city of Leeds uh, in the north uh, of England and also in the region of Northern, Northern, Northern Ireland. Uh, as you can imagine, Northern Ireland is a, is, a, is a region with a lot of complex problems, political, social, economical, et cetera, et cetera. Leeds has you know, its own challenges as well. But we are using a, a similar approach. And I am also I'm going to Montreal uh, in two weeks to confirm a uh, third program like this in, in Montreal. Uh, we have, our plan is to have four or five cities in the world that are going to start experimenting with this uh, methodology uh, during, the next, uh, during the next three years. So if there is any city here interested, please come and tell me. So what we are doing is, first of all, we are doing a, a deep uh, analysis of the narrative of the place, and we use ethnographic research to understand that. Because quantitative research data can give us a lot of information, but it cannot give us the information about the values and about the priorities that people have. And normally those values and priorities are missing in the bigger pictures. So we are conducting very uh, deep ethnographic research 
just to give you an example, this is, this is in, in Leeds only. This is a, a piece of research uh, funded by the Joseph Rountree Foundation. Uh, it's about it's an investment uh, about 300,000 euro just to conduct deep ethnographic research to understand what is the narrative of the place. From that, that ethnographic research and community engagement initiatives, we will uh, uh, identify which are the social networks, the key networks that are operating in the system in that city. And we will also identify which are the problems, the priorities for the people, and which are the initiatives that we can do. So we start this two parallel track of intervention that you see in the screen. In one hand, we do community engagement, digital participation strategy, open discussion. We, we are creating the narrative of transformation in, in the public sphere. And on the other hand, what we do is we identify very concrete projects that we are going to, de uh, to develop and that we are going to interconnect. So at the end of that process, what we got is, is uh, a public discussion about the way that the city wants to be projected in the future. On the other hand, very, very tangible projects that can be evaluated with their own business plans that can also be uh, uh, sustainable. So you have um, also kind of a, a graphic representing how do we build this new narrative of, um, of, of, of transformation. So well, this is what, uh, uh, what we are doing and uh, what I wanted to, to, to share with you today. I know I have introduced a lot of concepts that need to be uh, probably clarified and discussed, but I want to be a little bit uh, provocative for the audience. So I mean, I'll be very happy to discuss with you later, digitally, through Twitter or any other mean about these things. And I hope that this was helpful for our conversation. Thank you very much.